The following program does not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Reality Radio 101, its advertisers and sponsors, or its listening audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Bear Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker, Dr. Anna Baranowski, where mind, mood, and what matters to you are discussed. We're broadcasting live from Toronto, Ontario, Canada on Reality Radio 101. So get ready to send us an email. Our email address is in studio 101 at gmail.com here with you again today and today we're going to be talking about well what happens when we're sleeping dreaming having nightmares and you know like what that what is that all about? You know, dream content can be so confusing, but it also shows us that we're unbelievably creative people. And, you know, it's, it's an area that gets kind of uh, not really looked at too closely by people. Like you can wake up in the morning and you have this like really complicated dream. And it's like, you just go through your day and you forget all about it. Um, and never really give it a second thought. Or sometimes, you know, you can have dream content, which is super um, upsetting, and it kind of stays with you. And instead of really, really using it as an opportunity for you to kind of lean in there and learn about yourself and understand what dreams are all about, you know, we can push it away and kind of feel like it's something that we have to fix. So fix as in like stop happening. When I think about the clients that I work with who have um, very complicated dream content or um, frequent content. I always think of it as a really great place to do some uh, personal reflection and investigation, because I think there's there's so much about the dream content that can help us grow in ways that we do not expect. But that really it demands that we pay attention and that we give that content some time and space. But the reality is, is for a lot of people, the content can feel, you know, unsettling. And so instead of really giving it the time that it needs, we will just push it away. Well, I'm here to say, let's try to not push it away today. Let's actually try to use it as a mechanism of learning who we are and really being curious with ourselves. Like, you know, a lot of the stuff that I talk about, be warmly receptive of your own inner life and learn about who you are. Um, So to start with, you know, I want to just remind you that I'm always interested in what you have to say. So if you have thoughts or dreams or content or questions or comments, just email them. And uh, you know where we're emailing is to instudio101 at gmail.com. Um, email at instudio101 at gmail.com. And I will be really um, loving to receive those those emails. And, you know, as usual, I just want to remind you that this is really a conversation um, about growth and, you know, curiosity about who we are as people, as psychological beings, and an opportunity for us to open dialogue and be interested 
in who we really are as we grow together. So I'm going to start um, by um, sharing a dream that I recalled. It was a dream that I had. I know this seems kind of um, strange, but I had a dream in November of 2017. And because I'm I'm working on a second book right now. Well, it's not a second book. It's actually a third book, which is going to be a little bit different. The content is rather than um, clinical, strictly clinical in nature and strictly about um, my, um, you know, different strategies for uh, client recovery or teaching um, other therapists or clinicians or mental health providers or first responders or emergency providers. It's really about kind of the grit of becoming a trauma therapist. A, a lot more about my own personal story um, with the goal of maybe sharing things that might be interesting about what what allows us to grow, heal, and recover, what allows us to become the people we're supposed to be, even when we have trauma in our history or background. And, you know, I, I don't, um, you know, want to pretend otherwise, but, you know, my history comes with a huge amount of trauma, both my family of origin and the things that have happened personally to myself. So, you know, I think it's a good um, way to recognize, you know, if you have your own story and you've done a lot of your own work, you can see that there's a kind of like grit to life, but then there's also this place where we can grow in ways that are really truly unexpected and become kind of grounded in our lives. It doesn't mean that you're never going to have any troubles. That doesn't exist. Um, but but kind of grounded in your life and um, having had the opportunity to integrate some of your own life experiences. So right around 2017, I'm going to give you the backdrop story so you understand um, where I'm going with this dream. Um, because after I tell you the, the backdrop story, you might um, understand why I might have had this dream and just contemplate as you're as you're thinking about the backdrop as well as the dream content. So in November of 2017, um, after a lot of contemplation, I moved from the very terrific practice that I was sharing with a group of psychologists, my peers and my colleagues, I had worked with them for a number of years um, and uh, well, more than 10, 10 years, actually, uh, by the time I decided to move. And it was a great group to work with. I felt very privileged to work with this group. I, I really um, had a great experience, but then it became very clear that in terms of the specialization of the trauma work that I was doing, I had to really move forward and um, it was a really hard decision to make. I really grappled with it quite a bit, but I knew in my heart that the right thing to do was to open up my own practice. So in 2017, I moved from a, a group practice with my peers into um, the practice that I'm in right now, which is Bear Psychology or Baranowski Psychology Professional. And um, this was the dream that I had in November 27th, just as I'm moving into the new psychology clinic. Um, we were in the process of doing that. Remember, I don't recall my dreams very often, but this one was super vivid. Here it is. The mouse was standing in a small water dispenser in the cage. This was the only space already, not already submerged in water. Water drowned the soft wood chip flooring lovingly laid by someone not too long ago. The mouse looked straight at me with soft, intelligent eyes. I looked at the expensive cage with confusion. Obviously, someone really cared for this mouse. So why is the cage flooded? How long has it been since it ate? I threw peanuts into the cage and they landed in the water. The mouse jumped in and stayed down too long. I was worried then, or he or she popped up again. Was there something interesting below the surface? I was compelled to attend rather than recoil, but honestly, I've never liked rodents. They scare me. 
I remember having a dinner party a few years ago with a small group of friends and a tiny mouse jumped out of a cupboard and I screamed and then pulled everything out of the cupboards and screamed and scrubbed. It was upsetting. I took the cage to the vet so the mouse could get shots. This is still the dream and be safely transferred to a new cage. I just felt I had to do this. Also, I was terrified to empty the water myself because I feared the mouse's mate was drowned beneath the water. If you haven't guessed it, I'm the mouse in this dream. This is my mouse now, which is the weirdest thing to contemplate. I recognize myself in the mouse. And I wonder what you recognize as you hear the backstory and then you contemplate the dream and the elements of it. And if I'm the mouse, how it is that I'm looking at myself through the lens of this dream, because after all, who's creating the dream content? It's only me. It can only ever be me. So then we have to really, really take the time. Now there's lots and lots of layers to this dream. So I'm not going to go into all of it for you because you know it's complicated and you know just a curious way of thinking about dreams but the reality is is there's this really interesting layering of the details of dream content when we just give ourselves a few moments to think about it so I want you to think about some dreams that you might have had and you know what how you responded to them whether you were able to accept the dream content, you know, whether you struggled with it yourself. Um, and, and let's actually look a little bit even more closely because some people who think about a dream like the one that I just shared may be very terrified by it, may wake up and feel super distressed um, by that content. So, you know, it's important to also recognize that we need to look at our dreams even if, even if the content is very frightening to us, looking at our dreams and giving ourselves the opportunity to really reflect and um, take the time using very specific tools, both to uh, allow ourselves to you know, settle down after a dream if it was very um, upsetting, but also to work through it and if we need to, uh, to use some of the newer approaches for changing the ending. Now, I'm going to describe all of those things. And if we have time before we finish today, I'm also going to give you some suggestions around um, sleep hygiene and uh, strategies very specifically for working with your dream. I'm going to talk about that right away because I think that is super, super interesting. But what I want to start with is I want to start by actually taking a little bit of time and, and thinking about what the experts are saying about dreams and dream content. Um, this is um, Shelby Harris. And Shelby Harris is actually uh, somebody who knows a lot about dreams. She she is working with this um, type of um, education around dream content. And let's just take a few minutes and hear what Shelby Harris says about um, really distressing dream content. Are distinctly different from dreams in the way that people feel them and experience them. So a lot of people think that a nightmare is something where someone's chasing them and you have to wake up screaming. Yes, that's one of the more common nightmares that we see is the person's chasing someone or they're being chased. But really a nightmare just has to evoke some sort of, we call it dysphoric emotions or something uncomfortable. You could be sad, you could be unhappy, you could be scared, anxious. But it traditionally the definition is you have to be awake, you have to awaken from this nightmare. So you have it, you, you awaken from it and you can recall in detail what just happened. That's a nightmare. So it's very different from a dream where you generally don't wake up from it and you don't have this dysphoric emotion. There's some debate as to whether you need to awaken from them because there are some patients who are actually starting to say, I had these horrible nightmares, but I never woke up from them. But they can still recall them when they get up in the morning. So there's still some debate in the field. Um, when it comes to the reason why we have nightmares, we're still debating that. Um, it's a new area of research, nightmares. Uh, um, and 
the way that I like to think about it is our brain, we have stress during the day. And our brain needs to learn to process the stress. So there are people who have repetitive nightmares. And what happens is their brain is trying to process the stress and help their brain actually deal with what happens if the stress happens again. So their brain's preparing them to deal with it in case the stress happens again. But it's so scary that they awaken from it. So they're never actually able to finish the file and put it away. It just keeps happening because they awaken from it. So... Now, it's interesting, the timing of this. Um, we just got an email, and this one is from Larry. Hi, Larry. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and Larry says, what is the primary difference between a bad dream and a nightmare? And I think Shelby did a good um, job of explaining, um, you know, that dream content, you know, if it's upsetting, um, we may or may not wake up. This is a fairly new area of study. But it seems that the marker of an actual nightmare is that you will wake up um, in the middle of the night or when you've had it, that will be so um, distressing that you will be compelled to, to wake up. Um, and a bad dream, some people just, you know, they, they fall asleep, you know, they're sleeping, they have their dream, and when they wake up in the morning, they may or may not have uh, memory of that content. And, you know, one of the things that I found really interesting about dream content, and there's some um, documentaries on dreams and, and um, what they found is that, you know, if they hook up even animals, humans and animals, um, you will notice if you have a dog, we have two dogs and they're wonderful creatures, but, you know, every once in a while, I will see one of the dogs, you know, Jasper, Suki, um, you know, moving their legs while they're sleeping and even making sounds as if they're running after something. And you're like, wow, is my dog having a nightmare, a dream, uh, you know, acting something out? Like it's, there's, it's just so interesting that in fact, that content, you know, even for humans, you know, we may start to move as we're sleeping. And what we're seeing at that point is that um, there's something getting evoked with inside of ourselves and we'll stay asleep. We don't necessarily move at all. So you might have um, even upsetting dream content, um, but it's not uh, a horrific um, nightmare. Those horrific nightmares, people can wake up in cold sweats, absolutely feeling like they're in the middle of a war zone, um, recalling um, fragments of, of, of the worst things that have happened to them. I mean, that content is, it can be pretty upsetting. So it becomes very important to know what to do with that because I always find that if, if the content is repetitive, there's likely some themes in your life that you need to spend some time contemplating and really giving yourself the time to, to sit with that. Um, it's a it's a it's a way of respecting yourself. Um, this is another one. This one is from Carl, and he says, um, "Dr. Baranowski, wow, what a dream! Deep, very deep. Thank you for sharing. You know what? Uh, I have to say, Carl, I just uh, found that um, little segment. Uh, I wrote it in November of 2017, and it's going to go into the book that I'm writing." Um, so, you know, it, it's like, I was just, uh, gathering some content for, for the, um, for the book this morning and I just came across it right in time for the radio show. So go figure. I love it. I love how these things can work out, you know, just when you need it. Um, and this is, uh, from Dave and Dave says that is a very unusual dream, Dr. Weird in a way, um, well, no, I think you said, actually, Dave said, that is a very unusual dream doctor, period. Weird in a way, but very insightful. Thanks for that story. Excellent thoughts. Thank you so much, Dave. Thanks for joining us. Um, like I said, you know, it's great to, to have these conversations. So if anybody wants to share a little bit about a dream that you feel would be interesting for people to hear, fantastic. Moving on, I think, that dreams are remarkable. And um, Robert, Dr. Robert Augustus Masters is a expert in working with dream content. Now, uh, Dr. Masters does a lot of deep work with what we would call our shadow content. And that's kind of the content that we push below the surface 
that we don't really get access through to, um, you know, typical uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or therapies that just kind of skim the surface. And, you know, in his work, he encourages people to go quite deep in an exploration of themselves. So you're really, really learning about yourselves. And he sees dreams as a great um, kind of access point for that. And this is what um, Dr. Masters says. Dreams are the original home movies, self-made, self-revealing, private motion pictures edited by our own conditioning and broadcast to an audience of one who is not just a witness, but also usually up on center stage. Our dreaming consciousness is astonishingly creative and improvisational, fleshing out our shadow elements in instantly populated dramas that hold our attention. Dreams are private shadow theater. I think that is absolutely remarkable. It's such a great passage because it, it does such a good job of reminding us that we've created this content. Somehow out of us comes this content. And, and how can that be? And why is it? And why are we ignoring it anyways? <laughs> so, you know, part of today's radio show is me saying to you, this is a great way of doing your own inner healing is to really pay attention to that dream content. And with a great open hearted embrace, allow yourself to do your work around your dream content. So, you know, whether dreams are, you know, bringing out conflicts you're having in your in your personal life today, if you're having some difficulty making decisions, maybe you're having some trouble in a relationship and, you know, you kind of know something's off. And then the next thing you know, you know, you're you're having a dream that your partner or your spouse or, you know, is having an affair with someone or, you know, walking away from you or whatever it is, you know, like, you know, or yelling at you in your dream, something. Right. And it's like it gives you the opportunity to say like, wow, what, what is going on here? What do I need to pay attention to? That doesn't mean that you have to end your relationship. I'm not suggesting that at all. Um, I think that dream content is, is very representational in, in what it does is it captures themes and beliefs or worries but it does not necessarily do it in an absolute way. Like it doesn't mean like, let's say, for example, you, you know, you, you were a veteran and, you know, you experienced um, some events during your uh, career, during your military career. And, and now you're having um, nightmares, but the content is not an exact representation. It's, it's, it's got, themes and features, but um, the storyline is different than it would have been in your military career. And so you, you end up having to really examine what it is that the dream content is really showing you. Maybe in your life, you feel vulnerable. You know, maybe in your life, you learn that you can't trust people. Maybe in your life, you feel that you know, things are always coming to get you. And, you know, looking at the dream content and trying to really work through it, you can alleviate yourself of some of that trouble. Because, you know, especially if you're having nightmares and they're coming very frequently, working with the content in the light of day, it, it, it tends to give you an experience of um, having worked through it integrated it and being able to actually come to terms with the inner content. And then for a lot of people, what happens is that content is not as distressing night after night. If you let yourself really bring it to the surface. And I like having a light um, pen. So there are these pens that if you depress the plunger then um, and activate the pen, then it activates a light with inside. And so you can have a pen and a, and a notebook by your by your bedside and then if you wake up even at three o'clock in the morning you don't have to get out of bed or turn on a light a big light or any of that stuff you could just pick up your pen and work with paper and pen write out the dream content 
You can even write out a new ending if the ending in the dream was distressing. And if you write out the new ending and then read the whole thing through or think about, imagine the ending, a lot of people find they can go back to sleep after that. And that's actually a technique that's being used and has been researched. So I'll talk, if we have time, I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Oh, this is a nice one. This one's from Catherine. Hello, my fave dream is dreaming about listening to your radio show the night before. <laughs> that's funny. Love the show. Always so educational. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. That's very sweet. Okay, so let's talk about beginning to work with your dreams. And I'm going to draw from uh, Dr. Master's material because it's so interesting. And I love his conceptualization of private shadow theater. And remember, we, we are actually going to interview Dr. Masters, um, I believe in a couple of months. So we'll be able to ask him about, you know, shadow work and dream work. He's, he's really terrific. So if we think about dreams as short stories in which everything matters and everything has its place, including the kind of details that you think don't really mean very much or seem silly or bizarre or inconsequential, imagine that the author, you, that's you, you're the author, um, you're putting it all together. So you're having to really contemplate who the author of this content is, even if it's like completely strange, out of context, Seems like, a, as a, you know, Masters says, a discombobulated madhouse operated by its inmates. But to your core being, it's a multidimensional show mirroring all that you are in a dazzling array of fittingly costumed roles, inviting you to peer into the shadows. Ooh, his language is so great. I just think he's he really does a great job of, of putting to words um, kind of complex um, ideas and so vividly. Um, so this is from Monique and Monique says, when we wake up from a dream and we remember what we are dreaming about, is that the beginning for the dream or the end of it? Just curious. Okay. Let, let me think about what you're asking me, Monique. When we dream, when we wake up from a dream and we remember that we were dreaming, what we were dreaming about, is that the beginning of the dream or the end of the dream? Just curious. So, um, Monique, usually there is a beginning kind of middle and end of a dream and the content, like, like the dream that I had shared, you can kind of tell that there was a beginning, middle and end. And, you know, more than trying to figure out, you know, where to start, just start wherever it seems like um, is the, the first moment that you recall. That's your start point. And the last moment you, you recall, that's your end point. Um, and don't don't worry about organizing it. Just try to, um, if you're going to use a dream a dream journal, try to write it out from the beginning to the end point, whatever your beginning is perceived, whatever your end point is that you perceive, and then take your time and really go through it. Now I'm going to walk through a number of different ways to contemplate working with your dream content, um, and I, I'll also make sure that on um, the website where we're hosting the radio blog that we upload a lot of video links so that you have uh, content to work with as well, like examples to work with. Cause I wanna you know, make sure that you feel we're giving you some support that you can use as well. Um, so here's one way of working, keeping your eyes closed recount your dream in present tense. So you will allow yourself to just go through the content. Um, and if you want to, you can even share it with a friend or um, with a colleague. I remember when I was a little girl, um, my father used to have this repetitive dream. It was kind of funny. Um, I don't know, he used to share it with us he used to often share his dream content and I loved it when he did because his dreams were so interesting, even as a, as a little child, like, and I'm talking about, you know, maybe I'm 12 or 14 or something like that. Um, and, and one of his repetitive dreams 
was he would um, have this um, bulldog um, ring the doorbell at the house. He'd go to the door and there was the bulldog smiling at my father and kind of pointing out that the bulldog was pointing out that he had left a pile of feces. And my father was just like, would laugh about this. And it was just one of these very funny uh, moments like that, that this kept happening, that he kept on having this particular dream. Now, okay, I get it. You know, I mean, it could be about whatever that was about for my father. Whenever he told the dream, he did so um, with a great degree of um, pleasure, pride and um, amusement. So, um, you know, it was just one of those moments, you know, so it's funny. So he would tell us. So the exercise in this case is recount your dreams in present tense with your eyes closed, whether to yourself out loud or to a friend. Now, keeping your eyes closed just helps you focus the content and be really clear about the images um, and the representations that are surfacing. And when I say representations, remember, I'm not talking about a representation of what's happening in your real life. I'm talking about that representation, whatever it is, thematic, um, that is coming up in your dream content. So it's just super interesting to do that and really take your, your time with it. Okay, so that's one way. Keep your intuitive radar on high. So um, what I really am um, suggesting here is to not be caught up in interpreting the dream or analyzing the dream. And this is one thing I have a bit of a pet peeve with this. There are, used to be very popular for people to buy these books that, you know, kind of said, you know, in terms of dream content, oh, if you had a snake, it means this. If there's a chair, it means that. Forget all that. None of that really means anything. None of it at all, because, you know, a chair might mean something different to me. A snake might mean something different to you. And, you know, this is really about you having a real genuine relationship with you and your own content. And it's not about something that that somebody has um, kind of created a, a, a system for. And, and I don't think that those systems work anyways. Just my opinion, but that's what I'm going with. Um, so. The idea is as you're going through the dream content, just be curious. Don't try to analyze. This is not about, you know, making sense of the, the content and making it, you know, you know, come to life in a way that you can learn something right away. Let's let's kind of put aside our immediate goals and instead just stay in this very open, willing space where we're going to notice and learn. OK, here's another one. Notice all the personal details. So what, what that means is, you know, you really want to notice like, um, like my father's dream, like he was always laughing when he was telling the dream. So, you know, we would all see that he thought it was funny and amusing. And so we would join him in that um, kind of amusement. So he knew what his emotional state was and he was calm and he was um, obviously, you know, in a good state, um, loose and and funny. Um, so then you're really focusing. Maybe the dream for you is actually very tense and tight and upsetting. Notice that. Like, don't try to change it. Instead, just, just kind of look at all that is happening with inside of yourself. Here's another one. Remain aware of the key highlights. So you know, what, what you want to do, and it, this is why it really helps to write it out and then read it and then write it again and read it again and change the ending and read that and go back and forth. I mean, to me, it's like you really um, move to a new level, uh, even deeper level when you've had a chance to take your time and really kind of um, pay attention. But the highlights become very clear when you've spent time writing writing it out, you start really tuning in and asking yourself, what is really standing out for me in this dream? You know, um, and the more you work with your particular dream, the more likely you're going to find content that is really compelling within it. And sometimes it's not what you think 
it's not what you think it is that is most important. But the longer you spend with the content, the more of the fine details come to the surface. So, you know, sometimes you can tell tell the dream, you know, three or four times. It's not until the fourth or fifth time that some of the more subtle content surfaces and you say, you know what, I just noticed there was a door. I remember, I knew I saw that door right away, but I didn't remember it until just now. There's a door there and there's light coming through the door. And you know what? I didn't notice that door. And that reminds me of my life too, that I do have another option in life. I do have something else I can do, even though I have felt stuck up until this moment. So, you know, things like that can happen, you know, where it's like, pay attention. It means don't write it through one time and then leave it. Really stay with it, grapple with it, massage it. Ask yourself, what more can I learn from this? Okay. So then um, you want to just really go through it again and just track the emotional quality of the dream from beginning to end. So let's say you were telling somebody the dream and as you're sharing it, you can notice something changes in the pace and tone of your voice that you can recognize. There's something um, really loud or agitated or faster or um, there's just a change in, in your own feeling in your body as you're going through the memory of the dream, pay attention to that moment. Really go over. Like, you, you know, the, the seconds before and the seconds after the change in the tone of your voice, pay attention to that. You know, feel it, examine it, look at the content in that moment. Okay, now this is another one. Let go of having to find a clear meaning. Look, so much of our life is so structured. You know, we make so many demands of ourselves. Wouldn't it be nice to just be able to play with something? Be curious, creative? You know, you can use your dreams that way. You can just let them be a creative place in your life to play with, you know. And then, I mean, here's, here's another possibility as well. One of the things that you can do is if you're struggling in some way in your life, you might want to actually just set an intention in your dream content where, you know, maybe like myself, you know, I was trying to figure out, well, should I move to this new unit? Should I buy the new unit? Should I actually, you know, invest all that in, you know, making a new clinic? Here I am. I've got wonderful colleagues. I love it here. Well, you know, maybe... One of the things that I could have done is actually set an intention and said, you know, like, let me just contemplate that. Let me take that into my dream content. Let me be open in my dream content and let that focus my attention. Um, let the dream be about that. Let me see if I can look at it through a different lens, you know, using my the power of my creative unconscious mind to grapple with this problem. That's setting an intention. Now, I'm not suggesting you're going to have an answer, but, you know, there's some pretty interesting things that have happened um, with people who are setting intention using their dream content or creating something that they did not have any idea that they were going to create that ended up being very significant. And, you know, you know, dreams have been known to be the core creators of, um, you know, scientific research projects. Um, I think there was a famous song that John Lennon uh, came up with that was um, came right out of a dream. You know, it's like stuff like that. It's very interesting. Yeah, I, a number of years ago, I worked with um, a client and I was really grappling with how to um, take this client to a new place emotionally, um, psychologically, cognitively around something that um, he was really suffering with. And uh, one night I just went to sleep, really thinking about him, trying to understand you know, what was happening. And um, I dreamt about um, this exercise that I now call thematic map and release, which is very much driven on themes. So if the theme in this case with the client is, you know, nobody loves me. 
So, you know, the theme was nobody loves me. And now I have some great exercises to work with themes, whether the theme is, you know, I'll always be alone or nobody loves me or I'm a bad person or, you know, whatever the theme is, it doesn't matter. We all have these themes in different ways, but, you know, the, the, thinking about that client just before I went to sleep, I had a dream that then led me to create this um, process called thematic map and release, which I love. Very powerful. Okay. Um, reflect on everything that I've told you, um, different ways of working with your dreams, um, being open to, you know, what that content might mean, but really stay with it. So the exercise is really for you to look at it through a number of different lens, but really take your time and go over it multiple times. I mean, of course, there's people, there are people who work directly with dream content. I do this all the time in my clinic because I love the content and I think it, it really leads to very profound growth when people do the dream work. Um, but please understand there are many, many ways um, to, to do this work. Okay, here's a really wonderful way of working with dreams. Um, and again, we're, we're still contemplating the work of Dr. Masters. And um, one of the things that Dr. Masters suggests is that you, you know, you take a particular dream and you use the elements in the dream to have a conversation um, to speak with the elements in the dream. So you, you are speaking with really you as a representation of something in the dream. Maybe there's that door with the light behind it. Hello, door. Um, what is it that I need to learn from you today, door? And then the door would say something back to you, like here, there are options. You can open this door. There are new options that you had never thought about behind this door. Um, but, I'm going to give you an example from um, Dr. Masters, and um, we're going to just go through this because it's, it's, it's actually really interesting. This is about a, a patient of Dr. Masters called Bob, and Bob had an overbearing father, um, and Bob had learned to, you know, become kind of a soft person because, you know, the reality was he was really kind of devastated um, as a child, and the way that he kept safe was by, you know, n kind of being quieter and, and softer as a person. And that kept things between he and his father set safer for him. So, you know, we learn strategies as a child, how to stay safe in our life. But then Bob takes this kind of softness too far in his personal life, and he's having a hard time standing up and becoming the person he really wants to be. So here's, here's the dream. Um, Bob, uh, Bob, I'm walking down a dark road and I see a house with lights on ahead. I go inside and find a huge bear sleeping on the floor. It wakes up, looks at me, comes towards me. I'm really scared and can't move. It stands up looking directly at me. This is all I remember. So the, in this exercise, what would happen is Bob would be instructed to close his eyes, to breathe deeply and speak to the bear, but recognize that the bear is actually Bob, right? So, and Bob is instructed to speak to the bear as if he's right there in the house with the bear. And Bob says, please don't hurt me, don't hurt me. And at that point, the bear, who's Bob? Bob the bear, I don't want to hurt you. Then Bob says, why are you in this house? What are you doing here? And Bob is the bear says, I live here. I belong here. Bob now is tearing up and he says he's kind of relieved. And again, now Bob is being instructed to speak as though you are the house. And Bob says, as the house, I have enough room for both of you. I think that's just so profound. So it means that the, the bear, in this case, the bear in, in the case of this particular dream, based on Bob's explanation, was like frightening. It was kind of his um, powerful side, which he had repressed and rejected. And now the house, which is Bob, remember, because all elements are yourself. 
um, is saying, look, I have I have space for you, the soft Bob, and I have space for you, the Bob who, you know, can be like kind of alive and strong and that that's okay and that there's enough room for all of this. Okay, so this is really fun. I love this. Um, this is from Bart. Bart says, this show is so interesting today. I love it. Well, thank you, Bart. I love it too. I love this content. I find it so compelling because really, you know, we're really um, kind of driven by this stuff. I hope this is giving people some encouragement um, to, you know, to like really look at the dream content, your own dream content, because that's pretty exciting. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Bart. And um, this is from Ralph. And Ralph says, does certain foods or what we eat before bedtime affect our dream thought process during sleep? Um, I don't know, not necessarily. I guess it would really depend on who you are. My husband says that if he eats a heavy meal before he goes to sleep, he has a harder time. Um, it's not necessarily as deep a sleep or restorative because he's busy um, digesting. And that would be probably true for most people. However, um, you know, if, if you are going to ask this question, Ralph, then I would suggest that maybe when you eat certain foods before bedtime, there might be something that happens with you. So a lot of, a lot of what we really need to do in life is kind of really contemplate, you know, who we really are and how we are interacting with our life and our world. You know, you are your own unique person. So ask yourself in your life, when you eat certain foods um, before bedtime, especially, you know, if it's close to sleep time, um, what happens to you if you eat a spicy meal, let's say, or, um, you know, you don't eat anything at all, you know, is it having an effect on you? Uh, you know, I, I would, or maybe, you know, there might be another piece of that as well, because, you know, for some people, there's an emotional co component to eating. Um, if you find that you are like stress eating, you're eating late at night because you're feeling stressed or you're feeling lonely, then it may be the emotional content that is creating the dream. Um, you may have already been emotional about something and then start eating late at night because you're feeling emotional and you're using your food to um, suppress your emotions. So you might want to look a little bit at that as well. You know, it's just, it's a very good question. Thank you so much, um, Ralph. And this one is from Cindy. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Cindy, you're right. Um, <laughs> Cindy says, wow, doggy poop. The Baranowskis seem to dream about animals in weird predicaments. However, the doggy poop dream is hilarious. The mouse, I would be up on the chair. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Yes, well, you know, like, I mean, this is all about being curious. So uh, apparently it's true. The Baranowskis do have strange uh, dreams. But like I said, I don't have a lot of dreams. So I find them all, you know, very compelling. And, you know, they were, they were always something as I was growing up. Um, that, you know, if somebody had a dream in the household that, you know, we would share our dreams. It was just a thing. It was a thing in our house. So now it's a thing in my, my, my home life too. But, you know, I, I have them so rarely. I, I'm kind of jealous, a little jealous of people who have dreams all the time. Cause I think, wow, such interesting content. It really is. And this is from Tim. And Tim says, are dreams true? I mean, if someone dreams about having an accident, will it or can it happen? And then is it really a dream or an omen or are spiritual guides telling us something about something uh, as a uh, warning? And so that is a very interesting question. Um, I have to say that... Um, there are some very famous examples of uh, prophetic dreams. Um, and, and I'll just suggest um, that I don't have the answer to that question, but I will um, kind of talk a little bit about this idea of a prophetic dream. 
there was an artist who was um, painting um, his dreams. This was quite a few years ago. I think it was still in the 1990s somewhere. And, um, and he, he painted this art um, that was really related to his dream content. And what happened was um, one of the paintings that he, he drew was a painting of the uh, Twin Towers in New York City that went down. Uh, in 2001, 20 years ago. Yeah, so I mean, he, he painted these paintings in um, the 1990s, I believe it was. And um, the really uh, shocking thing was that, you know, he, he started to recognize years before that somehow his dreams that he was painting about um, were prophetic for, for him. I mean, this is what what he found that for him they were prophetic and the this particular one the dream content of um the twin towers going down looked a lot like um the twin towers going down and was painted years before it happened i think he painted it in 1997 i cannot remember all the details um but this man lived in the UK somewhere. So if people are interested in doing the research about it, you can probably find out about it um, looking up uh, prophetic dream art, um, UK or something like that. And, you know, you can learn about, about this man and the work that he did and, you know, how uh, remarkable that really is. And um, because it was all based on his, his dream content and, um, you know, how remarkable is that? So um, I think that, you know, it's, it's, who knows? I mean, the other person who's very famous who did prophetic dream art was Carl Jung, doc, Dr. Carl Jung. And, um, you know, he, he also had dream content that was related to World War One, I, I believe, where he had images that um, surface that were reflective of, you know, streams of blood and, you know, just, you know, bombs dropping and things like that. So he was having these prophetic dreams just before um, World War I. Uh, and, and I think that is really interesting. So I will leave it at that and not, you know, um, tell you whether I think that, you know, dreams are true or not, because I think what ends up happening in the end is, you know, if it's true that, you know, we're part of a collective unconscious, which is Carl Jung's belief, then, you know, there may have been something in the collective unconscious, which basically means, you know, in some, on some level, we're all connected. There may have been something in the collective unconscious, uh, a movement or a feeling or um, a trend um, that could have led to, um, you know, terrible destruction but doesn't necessarily have to, you know, because we've all had frightening dreams that didn't come true. I've had frightening dreams that didn't come true and I'm sure you have too. So always keep that in mind. It doesn't mean that it is going to happen or it must happen, you know, nothing like that. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind. I just think it's important not to, you know, believe everything that we dream because I think it, it's symbolic in a lot of ways. So keep that in mind, this idea of dreams being symbolic. And then, you know, just, you know, just the, just this idea that we can learn so much from, from the dream content and that it's, it's super exciting. Um, okay. So here's another one, Sean. Hi, Sean. Um, Sean just tuned in. I'm not sure if you've already discussed this. Um, REM, what does that mean? Um, so REM is rapid eye movement and rapid eye movement is what happens when we are actually right within the dream time. So when you're actually dreaming, right in the middle of the dreaming, um, if you were hooked up to a, a machine or a system, um, that rapid eye movement would be the indicator that you are right in the middle of dream um, and it can be um, captured. 
Okay, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's just a, it's just an indicator that that is happening at that very moment that you're right in a dream right at that very precise moment during rapid eye movement. And um, here's another one. Um, yeah. What about a sexual fantasy dream legal ones is this normal I have them all the time. Um, well, thank you very much. You know what that Again, that is really, again, it's really about you taking the time, learning about that content, because remember, it's likely symbolic and not actual. So it doesn't matter what the content is, whether it is uh, sexual fantasy or, you know, you're going to the beach or you're arguing with a partner or it, the idea is that you really just take the time and you treat every element of it as meaningful and important to you, you can learn something from that. Absolutely, if you're having sexual fantasy dreams, don't assume it's about sex. Don't assume it is about sex, okay? Because it may not. I mean, especially if something specific is happening. Like, let's say in the sexual dream content, you're reflecting on somebody being really um, gentle in in the um, se sexual discourse with you and maybe in your life you're you're hungry for a sense of um, kindness and intimacy like just contemplate what the theme might be what the theme is in your dream um, and what it is you have to learn and use all the tools that I've already discussed and if if you're just tuning in anybody we are going to post this just as we are um, every month, um, it'll go to uh, the website and you'll be able to find it there. And um, right now, I'm just going to tell you it, it's on a new site. So it's on, um, it's on our Anna Baranowski website and you'll be able to find it there, um, annabaranowski.com. Okay, thank you. That's excellent. We're almost finished. Oh my goodness. Um, this is from Greg. I could listen to you on the subject for, at, for hours, maybe just a show on interesting and maybe on interrupting dreams. This would be a winner. Um, yeah, that is actually a really good idea. You know what? Um, I might actually bring um, one of the experts on and um, we can have some more, some deeper conversations about the dream content. Uh, because it, it really is interesting, you know, it would be really great um, to talk about um, deeper and even more compelling dreams and how to peel back some of the layers. This is an area where there are actually, you know, there are actually experts who spent their whole career just um, kind of doing dream research, and um, and that's really exciting too, you know, there are people in, in doing this kind of work, and they are, you know, learning about it. The one thing I will encourage people to do is to actually learn a little bit about imagery rehearsal therapy, which is the kind of a work that you would do where you change the ending of your dreams if the content is very upsetting. Um, and so what you would really do with that is you would write out your dream content if you're upset and then at the very end, change the ending and then really visualize the new ending. And remember, you're the creator of the content of the dream and the creator of the content of the new ending. So it's okay to end it in whatever way you want so that you can feel some peace with inside of yourself around all of that. Because this is, you know, this is about you kind of learning about yourself and kind of taking some ownership of, of this content because it's yours and you can do it. So it's great. Um, and then finally, Susan. Hi, Susan. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm so intrigued with this subject. Thanks for this very interesting program. Um, it is my pleasure. I love doing this. Um, we are almost at the end. So I'm going to just add a few extra things. Um, and this is that. Treat everything in your dream as if it's part of you. So you're looking at that, at dream content through that lens. The chair is you, the house is you, the, the bookcase is you, the bear is you, the, you know, your friend who's sitting across from you is you, 
everything's you. It's all you. Treat everything in the dream as though it's in relationship to every other part. So that means that like in Bob's dream, the house had something to do with the bear and he had something to do with both the bear and the house and that everything was Bob. Remember that? So very interesting. It's like, yeah, when I said before at the beginning, the mouse dream, I'm the mouse, I'm the cage, I'm the water, all of those elements, they're me and they're also relating to each other. And treat everything in your dream as if it's worth considering and everything in your dream as if they are integrated and you need to pay attention to all the elements as it is always what is arising in you. And then I'm going to finally end with a couple of words by Dr. Masters. We must cultivate, cultivate as much intimacy as possible with both its detailing and its mystery, the dreams. To work with our dreams is to get firsthand exposure to our own shadow elements. So this is the deep stuff inside of us that we can pay attention to and use it to help us grow. Wishing you all a gentle day. Thank you for joining me today and have a great and uh, beautiful day. I look forward to speaking with you at our next meeting. Thank you for listening to the Bear Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker, Dr. Anna. Baranowski, right here on Reality Radio 101.